All right. Well, hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here. We're really excited to have a conversation with you. We're all creative professionals, um, as I'm sure many of you are. So we'd love to share ideas tonight and, and turn this into a real dialogue. Um, so first of all, we have the very talented Michael Larnell with us. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying, sticking around, watching the movie, all that. So Michael, when did you know that you wanted to be a director? Uh, I just happened to fall into it almost. Like, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I shot the movie. And I went to undergrad like in St. Louis uh, University. I majored in like business. So I went through like the four years of college, four years after college. I was just trying to find myself, but I never knew what I wanted to do until like I started running a website and I put videos online and I started working with cameras and editing. And that's when I got the bug. And then I went back to school for it. So. And that's when I really, once I started studying and learning about it, that's when I really went all for it. So, yeah. so you, it took a while. It took a while to figure out that I wanted to do this. And you've, you've come through NYU's graduate film program. Would you say that you need to have specialist education to make a movie? Is that important to get in, in building a career today? It all depends on who you are. For me, it was because I, I took so later in life. I took time to just not learn. Like just, it took, took me a while. So. Going to school, you're able to learn stuff faster than just learning on your own. So that was the benefit of going to film school. But you don't, don't have to go. You can just go film and learn. The more you shoot, the more you learn. So, so whatever your path is, that's pretty much the way to do it. Yeah, and in some ways, it's easier than ever to make movies. Equipment is cheaper. Um, people are putting things up online. There's a lot of information about how to make movies. And then there's more competition or more films to filter through, so it's not, it's easier, but it's still difficult. So. Yeah. So on Cronies, I know that you didn't just direct it, you wrote it, you edited it, I'm sure you played a role in producing it, you cast it, yeah, you even, it. yeah, <laughs> you even, you, I know that you, you made some of the t-shirts that some of the characters wore in it. Um, so you're just kind of wearing all the hats. Um, do you think that a, a, a filmmaker today needs to have all of those skill sets to be successful? Um, you can't trust, like you have, it's on me to make this movie. No one was going to tell me to go make this movie. No one is going to push me to make this movie. It was up to me to make this movie. So I had to do what I had to do technically, you know. So I wanted to make this movie, so I just did, went out and I, I knew. So a teacher told me this, like I have to put my name in every job until that job is filled. But some roles didn't get filled, so I had to do it myself. So. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you can do it. You just have to have that tunnel vision to get the job. Mm -hmm. Why was it important for you to tell this story? So I always, I knew I wanted to shoot in my hometown. I knew I wanted to tell a film over the course of a day. And a film like made in 95 was called La Haine. I actually started off wanting to make my version of that. But I wrote a script. It was kind of too big for, uh, I didn't know if I'd get the race of money in time or fast enough to make that movie. So I rewrote the script and like, just focused on these three guys. So La Haine is a film over the course of a day with three guys. So I went to, I, just, I thought of that. So then I just started developing these characters. I knew I had Lewis and I knew Jack and then I wanted to bring in a third character. So it just started developing. Like I would create these stories, to create the characters, their backstory, who they are. And then it just started developing into this script. So then that's where it just, it just started steamrolling in. I just, okay, this is pretty interesting. You know, it's similar, it's different as my story. It's in St. Louis, and it's cheap enough a budget that I can go out and do this. Yeah. If you all notice, like, the film is shot over, like, uh, during the day mostly, mostly daytime exterior. So it's kind of easier and faster to shoot that way. So, and we shot, like, 10, 12 days over, like, a two week period. And then we actually went back and, like, did two pickup shoot days. Like, I wrote some scenes to put in certain places. So, so overall, it was like 12 days, I think. What were some of the advantages to shooting in, in your hometown? Yeah, like I, it was just easier. Not, people don't really like, like New York, you, um, it's difficult because so many people, it's so much, oh, everyone is filming, so you got the cops messing with you or anyone can mess with you. So in St. Louis, no one is really like bothering you for real. So it's just easier. And then like, we shot at my uncle's store, we shot at my dad's house, we shot at my friend's house. So I was able to get locations, and we just moved faster, and it was my hometown. So I knew the landscape easier, so it was just easier to do. What would you say the biggest obstacle was in production? Um, 
Probably money and then, yeah, money. <laughs> <laughs> and time, you know, we have enough time. Probably time, more than money, time, yeah. But if you have money, you can have more time, so. Yeah. Probably money. <laughs> yeah. True in filmmaking and in life. <laughs> um, yeah. So would you do anything differently on your next project based on this experience? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't probably wear as many hats, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But if I had to, I would, but hopefully I don't have to. Yeah. So you put in a ton of effort to getting Cronies made, make it into the great film that it is today. Um, it was picked up by film festivals, it did really well on the film festival circuit. It premiered at Sundance, which is seen as this prestigious kind of the, the gold standard for independent filmmaking. Um, and it did great there. Um, what was, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to, to Ro, who's more involved in the distribution of this film, um, to talk about what was the strategy once you got there um, and to what had to change uh, once, once, you'd, once it had played there. Um, so I joined the, I'm a student at NYU Stern, which is the business school at NYU. Um, and I joined the project sort of well after it premiered at Sundance. Um, there's a team of five of us now, one of us is in the audience, Kamiya over there in the corner. <laughs> um, and we sort of joined the team like in September of last year. So Sundance had long since passed and I believe the initial goal was like 400 screenings. Um, right across North America uh, using Tug, which is an online platform that allows people within a community to bring a film to that community. They sort of harness their personal networks, tap into that, and um, create a, a screening for a movie that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to see. Um, so that was the initial goal, was to just self-distribute using Tug when I joined. And it's sort of shifted a little bit now that we've been working on it for a while and we've um, learned a few things, so it's a little more targeted towards educational institutions. Um, yeah, so that's our main goal, is to get it out to our target demographic, which is film students, people in transition around your age, interested in making movies, um, and interested in the kind of stories like this that feature other young people in transition. So, Something that can be a big hurdle for filmmakers is trying to connect to an audience. Um, if you believe that there is an audience out there for your story, and I think for the most part there is, because we're people and we need to find ways to connect to each other, but the traditional channels to get to that audience aren't necessarily in place. Right. Um, so if you can talk a bit more about what kind of options are there um, to self-distribute a project. <laughs> it's called creative distribution, because yeah. you have to get a little creative. So, Because yeah. some people reach out and then, like, yeah, you, only like traditional is theatrical, but other than that, it's all pretty much creative. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, just using whatever platforms exist. Like we had our premiere at IFP, right? So um, that was sort of an existing resource. They sort of look for filmmakers like right. Michael um, who don't have normal theatrical distribution deals and they showcase them for a week. So that got us an audience in December, um, again, tug, and again, just directly targeting uh, who we think our audience is. So uh, that's, I don't know, it's just sort of using whatever resources are. Yeah, exactly. It's about like, like using like what's presented itself. Like this film thing, it like everything will open up. Once, if you open your eyes and watch what's going on, like it, things will open up, opportunities will open up, and it's up to you to like kind of seize the moment and take hold of the opportunity. So that's how this is like, Different schools have reached out, different film societies have reached out. And we would have never screened in these facilities if we would have just gave up the rights and for like a few, a week, two weeks in the theater and nationwide, you know. It's better kind of to just create your options or whatever, whatever the best option is. Yeah. And I think like along those same lines, it's like, what do you want to get out of right. the film? So it, like maybe the film that you made is the, the goal of having traditional theatrical distribution doesn't match sort of what your personal goals are. If you are just trying to make a calling card or if you just want, you know, a certain type of person to connect with your film, then that's like a good starting point, setting that goal and figuring out, all right, with the, the budget that I have or no budget, how do I find the people um, or reach that goal, that goal that's specific to me? And then she said another thing like, um, like finding your audience, like, when I was in film school, they was teacher telling me, like, know who's your audience? Who's the audience for this film? You should know the audience and how to reach them. And I listened to them, but I was trying to make a movie, so I didn't really, like, care. I mean, I cared about who the audience was, but I knew. I just didn't know how to reach them. So that's probably the biggest 
draw for me doing this like creative distribution strategy is learning like okay I knew who my audience was but I didn't know how to reach them I didn't know how I was going to go about that other than online what's like this is the best way to watch a movie is in a theater with the audience so I didn't know how to reach them now I got a like a good idea which is doing it like this so. So, Ro, you've kind of been kind of spearheading the distribution effort, and you're working with um, a team of students. You, you have um, industry advisors to kind of build out how you can take this movie and, and let America see it. Um, what kind of qualities do you think it takes to actually get things done? What, what, do you, what does it take in the world of distribution? Um, if you have no money, um, <laughs> it's all about your team. And so um, I would say that everyone on the team, especially from the Stern School, is very strong in the sort of unique skill sets that they possess and that they bring. We're pretty a diverse group. We have different backgrounds, different experiences, different strengths and weaknesses. And so it's complementary. Um, and we're all, the one thing that is in common is that we care about stories and we really <laughs> care about this film and we really want people to see it because we think it's great. So um, that, those things in combination give you the resilience that you'll need <laughs> um, to find, find your audience with no dough. Yeah. You have kind of a unconventional creative path as well to, to where you are today. You've had experience um, working not just in distributing cronies, but um, working with Women Make Movies, amongst others. Um, but you started out as an actress. Um, what is that journey um, in terms of how, how do you find your creative passion sort of outside of the very traditional roles you might know about as you immediately enter a career? I would say... Um, <laughs> It starts with sort of getting to, I guess, the nitty gritty of like why you want to be in the creative industry. And so for me, we were sort of talking about this before, and but when you're young, um, the most visible roles are the ones that you gravitate towards. So, and I was a very outgoing person, so I naturally gravitated towards acting. Um, and that was the only way I thought you could create, you could express yourself create, uh, creatively. Um, so that's sort of what I pursued for quite some time. And then, as you do a little soul searching and you try to understand what it is that's driving you and what your purpose is. For me, it was like sharing stories, connecting with other people through sharing stories. So then that sort of opens up an array of different options for you career-wise. It doesn't have to be acting. There's so many different ways that you can do that. So um, that's why I went to business school and that's why I've sort of sought out unconventional um, project opportunities and internship opportunities because I need it to sort of match who I am. Um, so yeah. Okay. And that brings us to today, where, where Cronies is screening in theaters around the country. I want to open it up. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Hi, I'm Parisa. I'm, just, I'm not with anybody. I just <laughs> like watching documentary <laughs> films or films in general. Um, I really appreciated your soundtrack, and I was wondering if you could just explain the choices for some of those songs, and if any of those artists or musicians were also based in St. Louis. Yeah, they all were from St. Oh, Louis. That's like awesome. most, like ninety, per, ninety-five percent. Yeah, Nin yeah, close. But yeah, I um, so like the the casting director, the music supervisor, associate producer, he helped, like he runs like uh, different like hip hop shows in St. Louis, so he knew a lot of hip hop artists, so, and then I went online, you know, you can find anything online, so I found these artists and I, I would just pretty much find a song that can fit the scene, like the vibe of it, and that's what pretty much I went with. And then I, wa I wanted all St. Louis, and then, you know, it's easier to work with someone locally, you know, it doesn't really cost a ton, of, you know, so. So I wanted to give them some shine at the same time, help craft the feel of St. Louis and use their music to help get this feel out. Thank you. Thanks. May I ask you how you heard about this and what made you Oh, I guess I, I get the emails from Center for Communication and I've been to many of their events prior. So I am a fan of Center for Communication and that's my affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Ooh. Oh, another Thanks. thing about the, the music, so uh, like, re I chose different scenes for different, I mean, different music for different environments. So they go from like hood spots to the white areas to the blues. So like St. Louis is like a bluesy city, so like people listen to blues, and I want to use gospel music in certain scenes. So it's just the area they went to, I chose the music to fit that scene. I didn't want to just use all hip hop, all R&B. I wanted to like switch it up and give it different vibes throughout the movie, so yeah.
Hi, um, my name is Shade. I am a candidate for NYU School of Tisch for the film program, for the writers program um, for this fall. So I have two questions. One, my first question is how did Spike Lee get involved? And my second question is, is it worth it to go to grad school and pick up all those loans all over again to get into the industry when you have a hard time coming out of undergrad when you want to get into the industry? Uh -huh. So you think your only option is to go back to grad school so you could do internships, so you could pick up more experience in the classroom to get out there in the real world. So Spike, he came involved, like he teaches at NYU in the film program. So. Um, he teaches like the third year class, so I took his class and uh, you have like one-on-one -on -one advisement sessions with him. So I was able to like uh, go and talk to him, sit down, show him my work. So each year he gives like grant money to each, like several students that win grant money. So I won like one of his grants. And then I came back, I went and shot the film with some of the grant money. Then I came back and showed him like the first 10 minutes of the movie. Then he came on board, like he saw that and he wanted to become like an EP on the project. So that was dope. And then after that, so, um, we would sit down, like, he sat down, like, 10, 15 times helping me edit the movie. He's pretty much the main person helping me edit the film. So it was crazy just to sit down with him once every two weeks watching my movie and giving me notes. So that was a pretty great experience. So. As far as going back to school, I mean, it's up to you, you know. Like, just because you, like, that's how it was with me. Like, to me, I don't really care about loans. I don't really care about that stuff. I want to make a movie. So... Give me more loans if it's going to help me make my movie. That's just me, though. I wouldn't tell you to go take on all these loans because I don't know your drive. It take, it, take some, it take a special person to go out and face adversity and don't care about it as long as I, make, I want to make a movie. So I don't really care who's, I don't really care. So it's so really up to you. I wouldn't, it's up to you. So it's up to anybody, you know. I will say that heading into grad school, if, um, if you're heading in with the goal to just complete coursework and you know get a certificate and leave, then you are just going to leave with loans. Um, I think what Michael's done really well is use the school as a platform to create his film um, and use all the resources there. And I think a big part of that is the network. So being able to connect with, with other right filmmakers down. and other collaborators within the program, um, I think your peers are really some of the most useful relationships that you, could, that you can have, um, especially creatively. So I think networking isn't something that has to happen within a, within a film school. It's something that does happen more organically there than maybe just on the streets. But there's also other ways to grow your network. So that's you know, coming to events like this and sticking around afterwards, asking questions to people, finding your mentors. Um, I wouldn't say that film school is the be-all and end-all of, of how you get a project made. Yeah, it's not at all. Like, yeah, it was it was the best decision I made because like I went and worked really hard in the program. So, and I was able to meet different teachers and just to learn. I loved being around creative people. It just helped me learn even more. So it just helped my game even more. So, it's all up to the person. And but I mean, you've taken like writing or it's film. Yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult because you're just going to come out with a script, you know. But like she said, like she said, it's all about networking, utilizing that network. It's um, a little bit harder when you have when you get out of undergrad and you didn't use the network then. So it's like, how do you get back into that network? How do you, and a lot of people say intern, intern, you know, get into companies and meet those people and work with those people. So when you finish, they hire you, you know, working for networks and working on a set, you know. I mean, you can also just also sort of take initiative and get your projects out there. So if you're a writer but you're not a director and a producer, it's like use the networking to build up that team. Yeah, find people to like direct your writing. You know, it's one thing to have a script. It's another thing to watch your writing on screen, you know. Right. It's, a, it's easier, once you put something on screen, it's easier to get another one made because they can actually watch it work instead of reading it so they can see how it translates. So. Yeah. Yeah. Networking is sometimes quite a dirty word and I, I almost don't like using it because it, it feels very foreign and it kind of not at all like you're actually connecting to people. Um, but I think a big part of that is just being gutsy and being confident about it. So you mentioned, you know, not necessarily, um, you might be in a situation where under, you, you know, you finished your undergraduate and, and don't have a network from there, but you do because they're still there. You can reach up back out to those people um, and people are always interested in, in seeing a lot of people with high energy who are, you know, taking the initiative. So those doors are definitely not closed. Um, yeah, right behind you. All right. Um, my name is Philomena. I'm from LIM College. 
um, I wanted to know, like, where do you see yourself in, like, five years? Like, what is what you would say is, like, your success? Like, you've, you know, you've gone to, like, your highest point. And also, like, what kind of, I guess, um, demographic do you want to reach next on your next project? So, uh, yeah, I just want to make another movie for sure. <laughs> I mean, that's like, it's all about that, you know. No, but it's I know you spoke about like your target market and like, oh, like yeah, 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 okay. Um, I wanted to know like yeah. what audience would you target? Probably the same, same, like this, this is, so I, I learned from some, a lot, I learned a lot from this movie, like how to like make a movie but have it cross different people and different, like a lot of people um, that I've ran across that like this film are like, older white female ages uh, 40 and up, 45 and up. So those are the ones that reached out to me the most, honestly. So I was shocked, you know, I didn't, I would, that wasn't my target market yeah, yeah. at all. <laughs> but I was shocked. So I learned that, I learned like what probably drew, drew them to it, just to see the heart in these guys. So I kind of learned like apply heart and emotion to your film. Mm -hmm. You can pretty much reach a lot of, or touch a lot of different people or like grab emotions and stuff, so. So I pretty much, um, I don't know yet. Like, I'm working on it, but. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> the close part is the same um, people. It's this one. Yeah. So, uh, hey, I'm Gabriel. Hi, what's up, everybody? And um, I think one question I really was that was bugging me, well, that's been itching at me, was why'd you pick the word crony? Uh, it's got a, like, such a negative connotation with it, especially with things like crony capitalism and such things like that. So why pick that word, and then especially with like the concept of closeness and friendship, like are you, are you attempting to redefine the word, or are you attempting to like convey something in particular? Like, I'm so that word actually used to mean like friend, best friend, close friend, homie. Back in like the early 30s and 40s, it used to be that word, like a close friend. But then as it's, it's turned negative to cronyism and all that, but it started off being the word friend, like we call it, say, homie, homeboy, it used to be the same word, so I just, I Googled it, and I couldn't find a title for the, a year or so. Then I just, I just came across Crony, and then I used to like the word, the movie's Goonies, so I, like, oh, Crony's Goonies is kind of close, so, so yeah, so I was like, that's perfect, that, that was it. So, I mean, I guess with that, does that mean you're trying to convey a culture? Like, was the concept of the word redefine, redefining, like, I mean, how we does, view something? If it does, I mean, I don't really, go that route, you know, if it does, then it does, you know, I just, I just knew what it meant, I knew, I don't really care if people took it a negative way or whatever, man, like, I just, you can't worry about that stuff, you could just do what you feel in your heart or whatever that you want to do, and you just put it out there, you know, you just can't, you can't please everyone, you can't do any of that, you just got to worry about, focus on what you wanted to do, and just go do it, man, you know? All right, and just last thing was, um, why, like, what was the inspiration for the, for Jack and Lewis, that particular dynamic, and why did you pick Andrew? Like, besides the obvious, like, besides the fact that he's a white kid, like, what was more than just the obvious contrast? Like, what's the whole thing that was going into the thought process? Yeah, so, so Jack is the bad guy, obviously, and um, so I, so I wanted to, like, Lewis is obviously trying to move out of this relationship, this friendship, and he's so, so Andrew is in the workspace. That's where Lewis is trying to run to, to get away from Jack and start his family, build his, this, this life, another life. And uh, Andrew was almost similar to Jack. They just different races. And that's what I was trying to do. Like you can, like it doesn't matter. They still have similar interests. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Asian, whatever. You run across these type of people all the time. So I just wanted to show that. Like, and then I just wanted to bring in this different, so we're all the same at the, at the end of the day, so. Awesome, that thank makes you. Sense, yeah. yeah. Hey, how you doing, man? Um, my name is Caesar. Uh, first of all, great film, I really liked it. Um, and so a lot of the characters that in, in, in these kind of films, it's like their own persona is being brought out in the film, right? So um, me personally, I, I have a, a film that I'm, I'm personally script writing about. And like you mentioned, you have to fit the, um, the job title. Like, you have to put yourself until you find somebody. So um, one of my concerns was, as far as the dialogue in, in, in the script and as far as the dialogue 
that the the characters came up with. Um, how 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 was it? Was it very significant for it to match, or did they kind of like improvise? All right, so so it's, the movie is split up into two parts. It's the narrative section, and then it's the interview section. So the narrative is pretty much all scripted. Like we pretty much stayed on. We didn't have time to like improv really. I would let them like say the words the way they wanted to say it, but they pretty much stuck to the script because we were just moving. We didn't have time, so that was scripted. But then. So I wrote the, the interviews where, I, so I would write a question like to answer different parts of the movie. So we'll get the interview at this section. I knew I had to like, I wanted to convey different more information to you all guys, to you guys. So I had to like, write, I had to have the audience to say what they felt during this moment. So I cut to the interview and they say what they really felt. So I would, they would, I would tell them a way to write, to answer the question, but then I would, um, they would improv after that, like I'll piggyback off that. So we go back and forth, but we, they'll answer on script and then we'll piggyback off that. That's when we get the banner and the relaxation, but they, we pretty much stayed on script, but then we had to improv in certain ex sections. So yeah, so Hi. both. Thank you. Hey man, my name's uh, Danny. I just have a question about the shots. I thought the shots were incredible. They were really cool. They're like an in your face type of thing. What was the inspiration for that? Yeah, I like to be in your face. Like that's, I love yeah. post-ups. I love like just throwing the camera in. The, actually, I love throwing the camera in the, the actors' faces too. Cause yeah. they, they go ahead. Uh, I'm just saying because like even during the interviews or like most of the movie was just pretty much like right here. So it's like I felt like I was there with them, but like why? Yeah, I'm just a fan of close-ups. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> cause I, I don't, we, I guess cause we never, in, we never close up to each other's faces, so you get to see the different looks and stuff so but then i mean it is some wise stuff too though actually like medium wise but. It, it was cool because like you pulled out from there so it's like you got the close-ups and then a little bit of wide and then back to the close-up so it, it yeah. was a neat dynamic yeah i'm a fan of close-ups yeah awesome thank you thanks hi i'm ariel i'm a grad student at columbia and you spoke to women of a certain age being interested in the film i was wondering if you could speak to the role of the women in the film and how you developed those characters good question um so it, it wasn't about women in this movie it was more about like these guys and then yeah so i really like i knew the main only so you have his mom like so i guess like I want to, like I use Jack's mother as like a, a catapult to like show his another side of him. Like he's able to love, like he's just not a total asshole. Like you can, like you know, like he has another side to him. Like yeah, and I know people like that. So like he, and then another thing with Jack, oh well, yeah, so, yeah, Jack. He's like I put, he's like this was like him acting out today. So I had to put his mother in there to show another side to him. And then Lewis's uh, girlfriend. That's just another side of him. We didn't really couldn't explore that because it was all about them. We, we was out of the house, but yeah, I just definitely wanted to show Lewis and like him trying to build a family, which is difficult for a 22 year old. So, so that's another reason. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kevin. I graduated from the new school. Um, thank you for this film. I thought it was pretty great. You know, as I was watching it, I was thinking, if Mo Better Blues and Do the Right Thing had a baby, it would be this <laughs> film. Um, so I, that's a compliment. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't. Okay, yeah, it's right? definitely a compliment. Um, but I have a question about post production. Um, there's two parts of the of the film I was just curious about. Um, the scene where the gospel song is playing and it kind of cuts and and you see the woman there kind of singing in the in the park. Um, that and then also too at the end when it goes from black and white to color. Is there anything deeper? Like why did you choose those two moments where it kind of I'm not sure, like what, it was it symbolic for you or was it just a, a style thing? So the gospel thing, yeah, I definitely wanted to um, have a lady singing somewhere in the movie, so yeah, and then gospel. So I grew up like in the church, but yeah, yeah, and I just wanted that. And I, I, I figured that was a good moment in the film and then just to have it playing in the car and then transition to on the street, I thought that was just cool. You know, sometimes you just do stuff, it's just cool. And then the color thing, uh, it is to show them in a new light, new color, new space, and that stuff. But that actually was Spike's idea to put it at the end and in color. So, yeah. But it is like I learned it is to show a new, new day, new life, new day. Because we don't see them in color. So, and then the movie, it is something new. They've changed, or actually, you all changed. They really didn't change. 
you all that. That's the, that's the one thing that's special about this film. You guys change versus, versus them. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Yemi. I'm a junior at NYIT, and I was wondering about the casting process for like such a like kind of low budget film, especially with the characters because they seem like the the actors seem to like really know their characters, and v especially since the characters are so distinctive and like kind of like not the average, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So no. Um, so everyone like shot in St. Louis. I knew I wanted to have like local people act in this movie. So um, they are pretty much everyone in the movie was never acted before. The only person that acted and she did like stage plays was the jump rope girl. So that's the only, <laughs> and she only did stage plays. Everyone else like this is their first time on camera acting. So um, I pretty much put them through like an improv section. They had to come in and we did a like had them improv with each other. And then I brought them back again, that's when they read lines. I pretty much picked the best outgoing person for one, and then two, the one that had a certain energy that I could see fit the characters. Like the guy that, Zorg, he's, he's Jack in the movie. He's nothing like Jack, but he has an energy about him. Like I, I felt, man, that could be cool on camera to match this guy, Jack. So yeah, he had an energy. It was more just like he's outgoing. You know, I pretty much try to craft or put the person so they don't have to do that much and they can just, but they all did pretty good, you know. Like, I was, I was happy with it for sure, so, yeah. My name is Jesse. I am a freshman at uh, Marymount Manhattan College. I'm just wondering, what was the audition process like? Like, how long did it take? Was there, like, specific things that you were looking for? Yeah, so, uh, like, it took maybe, like, a month. So we had, like, we had a casting call all around St. Louis. So, like, even the news picked up on this casting call. So we had, like... Thousand sent in emails, but then we only had like maybe a few hundred come out. And then from there, they came out, did the improv, and then we'll, we'll bring certain people back that was just pretty much. So when you have someone improv, you can really see who they naturally are. Like the people that are most comfortable with improv, those are people that came back. Some people just didn't, couldn't really do improv. You can't do improv, you can't do, you can't read a script, <laughs> you know. So I uh, pretty much brought any, anyone back that did good in the improv that was really relaxed, really natural, really just was just, they didn't care about, like a lot of people, when you do improv, a lot of people, they, don't, they forget that we're there. They just pretty much working with the person next to them. They forget about us, and that's the person I brought back. They didn't care about the camera. They didn't care about us watching. They was just watching. Then I brought them back, and then the people who came back with the lines and read the best, I brought them back again. And then I read again with different people. that were, Now we have two pretty good people. So we had a lot of people really to choose from. So, so it was, I, was, I was surprised, like, honestly. Because yeah, like in St. Louis, there's no acting. There's pretty much like not really a lot of film going on, like in New York. So, so yeah. Great. Um, do we have time for one more over there? Or? Sure. Uh -huh. sure. Just one last one. I just wanted to point out. Let the microphone yeah. Okay, so she wants to know about the gold teeth. So I actually did write, I mean, it's another visual thing. It's just like, when you're making movies, like, you have to put visual stimulating stuff. Anything that can, like, stimulate you guys just to be surprised by, just to wonder by. Yeah, and then gold teeth down there is a thing, so, yeah. Actually, it was his. I mean, he could take it out and in, but it, he did come. That's another reason why I cast him. He came in with the teeth. I was like, man, this guy, I wrote it in the script, and he comes with it. So I was like, wow. <laughs> OK, let me bring him back. And he, he actually came back like he was the only person in the audition that knew his lines. Like everyone had to have a paper almost, or they may forget. He pretty much, I mean, it was, that's not important at all. They can not know the lines and still, I still may cast them, you know. So that's not important, but just surprising that he was the one. Because he had a lot of lines in the movie. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, it's been great chatting with you yeah, guys. Thank you have you. great, great questions. <laughs> Well, it's like, I think you could just look what's how do you spell it? What's it? What is it? Okay. Because it's like, you could just look it up in the NYU. Today?
It all depends on who you are. For me, it was because I, I took so later in life, I took time to just not learn. Like just, it took, took me a while. So going to school, you were able to learn stuff faster than just learning on your own. So that was the benefit of going to film school. But you don't, don't have to go. You can just go film and learn. The more you shoot, the more you learn. So, so whatever your path is, that's pretty much the way to do it. Yeah, and in some ways, it's easier than ever to make movies. Equipment is cheaper. Um, people are putting things up online. There's a lot of information about how to make movies. And then there's more competition or more films to filter through. So it's not, it's easier, but it's, I mean, it's like I have to put my name in every job until that job is filled. But some roles didn't get filled, so I had to do it myself. So. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you can do it. You just have to have that tunnel vision to get the job. Mm -hmm. Why was it important for you to tell this story? So I always, I knew I wanted to shoot in my hometown. I knew I wanted to tell a film over the course of a day. And a film like Made in 95 was called La Haine. I actually started off wanting to make my version of that. But I wrote a script. It was kind of too big for, uh, I don't know if I'd get the race of money in time or fast enough to make that movie. So I rewrote the script and like just focused on these three guys. So La Haine is a film. Well, hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here. We're really excited to have a conversation with you. We're all creative professionals, um, as I'm sure many of you are. So we'd love to share ideas tonight and, and turn this into a real dialogue. Um, so first of all, we have the very talented Michael Larnell with us. Thanks for coming. And thanks for staying, sticking around, watching the movie, all that. So Michael, when did you know that you wanted to be a director? Uh, I just happened to fall into it almost like I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I shot the movie and it was difficult. So. Yeah. So on Cronies, I know that you didn't just direct it. You wrote it. You edited it. I'm sure you played a role in producing it. You cast it. Yeah, you even, it. Yeah. <laughs> you even you, I know that you, you made some of the t-shirts that some of the characters wore in it. Um, so you're just kind of wearing all the hats. Um, do you think that a, a, a filmmaker today needs to have all of those skill sets to be successful? Um, you can't trust, like, you have to, it's on me to make this movie. No one was going to tell me to go make this movie. No one is going to push me to make this movie. It was up to me to make this movie. So I had to do what I had to do technically, you know. So I wanted to make this movie, so I just did, went out and I, I knew. So a teacher told me, and I went to undergrad, like, in St. Louis uh, University. I majored in, like, business. So I went through, like, the four years of college, four years after college. I was just trying to find myself, but I never knew what I wanted to do until like I started running a website and I put videos online and I started working with cameras and editing. That's when I got the bug and then I went back to school for it. So and that's when I really, once I started studying and learning about it, that's when I really went all for it. So, yeah. so you, it took a while, it took a while to figure out that I wanted to do this. And you've, you've come through NYU's graduate film program. Would you say that you need to have specialist education to make a movie? Is that important in, in building a career? 